The reputation of Muhammad Marmaduke Pickthall, who lived from 1875 to 1936 in contemporary Islam, is strangely ambiguous. He is, on the one hand, well known as a foremost British convert to the Muslim faith, and he is even better known, or even famed, as a translator of the Quran into English. On the other hand, he is a character from another era, an era that has passed. And so contemporary Muslims, including today's converts to Islam, have some difficulty appreciating his life and work. He is always mentioned among renowned Western converts, yet such mentions rarely extend far beyond his name. His story is not related because it does not resonate with Islam in our times. Pickthall's Quran, although rightly celebrated as a great achievement, is written in an English that is now archaic and difficult for contemporary readers. His life is the same. His journey, his struggle and his point of view is not relevant to our times. Today's Muslims, especially British Muslims, are happy to claim him as one of their own and they know that he was a significant figure in his own era but it is hard to place him within the landscape of contemporary Islamic ideas and so, and so reception of his legacy is muted. He was once the preeminent convert to Islam from the English-speaking world. Marmaduke Pickthall is an old-fashioned name from the past. It is, however, the fact that Pickthall does not fit neatly into the contemporary Islamic milieu that makes him a useful subject of study. The fact that things about which he was passionate, such as the Ottoman Empire and the Nizamate of Hyderabad, are now causes long lost and quite irrelevant to our times, can still serve to remind us of the extent to which the world and Islam have changed. Pickthall does not belong to modern Islam. He saw and belonged to the twilight of what we might call classical Islam, and a study of his life and works alerts us to how remarkably different the Islam of today is to the Islam that he loved and eventually embraced. The purpose of this presentation is simply to draw attention to the most obvious of these differences and to give a sketch of the classical or traditional Islam to which Pickthall belonged. The son of an Anglican minister, he was raised in an atmosphere of comfortable middle-class English piety and attended good schools, but as a young man he developed a deep interest in the so-called Orientalist scholarship of his day and then began travelling to the Middle East with a view to learning the Oriental languages. He had been sickly suffering from chronic bronchitis from an early age and the warmer climate of the East suited him far better than did England. And so, from his early 20, 20s onwards, he became a, a lover of the Levant and of Turkish and Arabic culture. In England, he became a leading member of the Anglo-Ottoman Friendship Society and began to promote tolerance for an understanding of the Oriental other. His travels were supported by his mother and by his writings. He was the author of over 30 novels, most set in the Orient, and of travel books, journals and essays. His interest in Islam as a spiritual home as an, and as an alternative to the Christianity in which he had been born seems to have developed early, but his official conversion to the Muslim creed did not occur until much later, either because of his own hesitations or, as some supposed, because he was waiting until after his mother died. By his own account, the matters that galvanised him and set him firmly on the road to conversion were a reflection of the political climate in English, English society and a hardening of public opinion against the Turks. The British had once seen the Ottoman Empire as a friend against Russian Tsardom. It was felt that the Turks were benign, civil, indeed noble, and maintained peace and good governance in the East. Consequently, there was a considerable foundation of cross-cultural relations and goodwill with Turkish civilization. For their part, the Ottomans were looking to closer relations with European powers. This was mainly because their once great empire had in fact grown complacent and corrupt, had been outstripped industrially, technologically and militarily, and so was weakened and increasingly vulnerable to external aggression. Its hold over its territories and over the ethnic groups under its administration was slipping. It had gone into terminal decline, but it maintained all the appearances of its faded glory 
and the pretense of a sumptuous greatness Europe remembered and admired. Then, late in the 19th century, British interest began to shift, and from about the Prime Ministership of Gladstone onwards, antagonism grew between the Turkish and British empires. Public thinking soured, and to turn Turk became synonymous with treason and treachery. Pickthall relates an occasion where he was attending Sunday service at an Anglican church and being shocked and upset by prayers and psalms dedicated to the Ottomans' demise. He reached a point, he said, where he could no longer participate in Christian worship, and then it was only a matter of time before he would accept Islam. When he finally announced his conversion publicly, it was a dramatic event. He was a well-known figure, and his conversion was taken as a statement of protest and defiance. Contemporary Muslims can appreciate the rising tide of anti-Islamic sentiment against which Pictou made a stand, but his political context was almost the reverse of our own. Pictou was a Tory, a social and political conservative, a lover and defender of religious tradition, and indeed of the British Empire and the Crown. He was very far from being a radical left-wing activist. In his time, the British upper classes and aristocracy tended to be sympathetic to the Ottomans, and there were a surprising number of converts in those circles. In terms of British politics, it was Labour that led the frenzy against the evil Turk. In our own time, it is not a generalisation to say that the conservative wing of political life is on the whole averse to Islam, while the more multicultural and internationalist left tends to a more sympathetic perspective. The right tends to view Islam as a threat to Western values and to Western cultural in integrity, while it is the left that is less inclined to view Muslims as the enemy in a clash of civilization scenario, and who are opposed to such Western supremacist and interventionist mis misadventures as regime change in Iraq and Afghanistan. Today's politics is quite the reverse to that of Pictou's time. For this reason alone, Pickthall is hard to situate within contemporary Islam, a right-wing conservative convert to Islam. The Muslim communities now living in the West, including Great Britain, are working-class immigrants, and the new generation of converts is largely drawn from disaffected and unemployed urban youth. Pickthall's politics makes little sense to them. The political axis has shifted fundamentally in this regard. It is Pictou's lifelong endorsement of empire, both the Ottoman and the British, and as a mode of government in general, that especially places him in a bygone political milieu. Our post-colonial world can only imagine empire as an evil, as a device of oppression. For Pictou, it was a precondition of freedom. He writes of the Levant that greeted him as a young man as a ex world of extraordinary freedom. In our age, we associate freedom with the nationalist liberation struggles of peoples clamouring to rid themselves of imperial rule. In their strategic moves against the Ottomans, the British gave support to Arab nationalist aspirations. When first the Ottoman and then the British empires dissolved, they were replaced with a patchwork of local nation-states. Pickthall saw this as an approaching danger. He warned against the rise of petty nation-states and valued the stability and commerce that empires allowed. In his view, the Ottoman Empire in the East, and also British rule in India, enabled religious and ethnic tolerance and a broad and diverse pan-Islamism -Islam to prevail. Pickthall warned that if these empires crumbled, their territories would become arenas for civil war, tyranny and ethnic cleansing, with Muslim at war with Muslim. And worse, it would bring to the East a new insidious institution, the intrusive modern state. The freedom that Pickthall found in the East was a libertarian freedom from the state. He describes how in Palestine, local life continued under Ottoman rule exactly as it, as it had done for centuries. Most people, he said, would never see a policeman in their entire life. Instead, life was regulated by the organic patterns of Islamic law and culture. People knew that they were ruled by the Caliph in Istanbul, and they respected him and mentioned him in their daily prayers, but they also had nothing to do with him, and they expected that he would stay out of their daily affairs. 
Pickthall found rich pockets of tradition, local Islamic life in the Levant, sheltering under the umbrella of Ottoman rule. He feared what would happen if the Ottoman lands were broken up. His views, his views on this were surely prescient. The monster of nationalism, Jewish and Arab, have since torn Palestine apart. His views on what constitutes freedom were prescient too. He witnessed communities living in the bosom of a benign nomocracy, free of an overbearing state. Since his time we have seen the ugly reality of the modern Islamic nation-state and what happens when traditional codes of law are perverted by centralised and technological bureaucracies intent on micromanaging their citizenry. Pickthall knew an Islam from before the nation-building ideologies, nationalist revolutions and reconfigurations of modern Islam. The demise of the Caliphate is the most obvious difference between the Islam of Pickthall's era and that of our own. An Islam without the Caliph was once as inconceivable as Catholicism without the Pope. But 20th century Islam has had to adapt to the final dissolution of the Caliphate after the collapse of the Ottoman elite in Turkey. Modern Islam is a post-Caliphate Islam and, as well, the medieval geographical reality called the House of Peace is just a distinct Islamic world over which the Caliphate ruled came to an end. It was chopped up by national boundaries and then by migrations. In Pickthall's era it was impossible to imagine that by the end of the 20th century many millions of Muslims would be living in Northern Europe. Today, remarkably, there are more Muslims in Germany than in Lebanon. The idea of a distinct geographical entity the House of Peace is today as unreal as the concept of Christendom. The more important change in modern Islam, though, was a direct result of the British endorsement of Arab nationalist struggles against the Turks, namely the elevation of the Wahhabi sect into power and prominence. The British stirred the Arabs against the Turks. This necessarily entailed supporting the Arab style of Islam. The Arabs had long been under Turkish domination. Turkish Islam was moderate of the Hanafi school, with a strong mystical Sufi elements. In the 18th century, a reactionary reform movement, later called Wahhabism by its opponents, had begun among the Arabs that purported to return Islam to its pristine roots in response to the supposed pollution of the faith by foreign, that is, Persian, Turk and Indian innovations. Based in strict Hanbalite law and viciously anti-Sufi, Wahhabism sought to rid Islam of its medieval abuses. This meant stripping the religion of medieval developments and promoting a Puritanist form of the faith. The Wahhabis and the British supported the warlord chieftain Ibn Saud and legitimised the Saudi dynasty and its struggle against the Ottomans. In the periods when Wahhabis took control of the holy places in Arabia from the Turks with British support, they proceeded to destroy 1,500 years of Muslim heritage, including the desecration of the tombs of the wives and companions of the Holy Prophet. In due course, they established themselves as a modern kingdom, and subsequently blessed with massive oil reserves, they used their central place and their wealth to promote Wahhabism as a normative Islam. We forget that the Wahhabi sect had little or no influence upon the Muslim Umar before the 1930s. Today, Wahhabi thought and money has left a mark on every corner of Islam right across the globe. By this factor alone, the entire religion has changed. Reading Pickthall reminds us of what Islam was like before the Wahhabi ascendancy. It was an Islam tempered by the earthy wisdom of an old civilization rather than an Islam inflamed with the zeal of Puritan reform. In many ways, the Islam to which Pickthall converted has completely disappeared and been replaced by an entirely different entity, largely formed by Wahhabi control of the Hajj and radiating out from that centre. Pickthall warned the Puritan Puritans and fanatics would move into the void if the moderate codes of Ottoman Islam were recklessly overturned in the Muslim heartland. He saw that Turkish control of the pilgrimage had a moderating effect upon the entire body of world Muslims and feared the alternative.
A key feature of Wahhabism is a rejection of the traditional Sunni schools of law. It regards the medieval legal infrastructure of such schools to be unnecessary innovations, or bida, that detract from the plain teachings of the Quran and the Hadith literature. Wahhabism is characterised by a stark literalism in contrast to the complex and nuanced methodologies of the four schools. In Pictal's works, both his fiction and his travel writings, we encounter the tapestry of traditional life created and sustained by the Ottoman legal codes under the auspices of Hanafi law as a living edifice. As Pictal observed, the patterns of traditional law yielded a rich, profound culture at once pious and tolerant and moderate by today's standards. When modern revivalists clamour for the reinstitution of Sharia law, it is the ossified literalist law of Wahhabism they mean, enforced by a modern state. This is not Islamic law as Pictal saw it. Again, for him, the traditional ways of life, patterns built around the five daily prayers and an understanding of domestic life as a prolongation of the mosque, for example, was a vehicle of freedom. In modern Islamic states, such as the Wahhabi-inspired Taliban state established in Afghanistan, Sharia becomes a tool of terror and oppression, caustic revolution and social purging. A modern reader can hardly appreciate Pickthel's altogether benign and felicitous descriptions of life under Islamic law at the close of the 19th century. Several features of Pickthel's celebrated Quran underline the extent to which his views and approaches anticipated and worked against modern fundamentalist ideas. For example, he deliberately chose to not translate the word Islam to mean the religion Islam, but instead translated it and its derivatives as peace and its synonyms. He reasoned that there was no such religion as Islam in the Quran, and certainly not in the partisan sense of Islam as one religion amongst others. This should be contrasted with the new official English translations being promoted worldwide by the Saudi Arabian religious authorities, which in fact interpolate the word Islam or Islamic monotheism as against the nefarious Jews and Christians in the most aggressively partisan sense at every turn. Pickthall's translation is a masterpiece of careful, judicious and moderate language. The extent to which it is shaped to counter pernicious trends then emerging in modern Islam is among its less appreciated qualities. For the contemporary Wahhabis, the mere fact that Pickthall was not a native Arab speaker disqualifies his translation from all consideration regardless of its qualities. One of the famous, most famous episodes in Pickthall's life was his heroic attempt to have his translation accepted by the alumma at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, then the unquestioned intellectual centre of Sunni Islam. He debated toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Muslim scholars in Arabic, a feat he said that turned his hair grey overnight, responding and meeting their objections and discussing the very nature of the Quranic revelation and its language. In the end, the body of scholars remained unconvinced, but Pickthall was urged to proceed with the publication of his rendering all the same. This was the first time that a rendering of the Quran into a European language had received the imprimatur of the leading scholars of the Muslim world. After Wahhabism took its grip upon modern Islam, Pickthall's translation was shunned in favour of that of Yusuf Ali, purely on the grounds that Yusuf Ali was a born Arab Muslim and not a convert. After the calamities that led to the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire, Pickthall turned his attention to British India, India and spent the second half of his life as an educator working for the Nizam of Hyderabad. The Nizamate consisted of a Muslim state extending throughout central India. It was, in many ways, a surviving prolongation of Mughal Islam. The Nizam was a great friend of the British and developed intimate links with British aristocracy. He well understood that the survival of the Hyderabadi Muslim state depended upon the shelter of the British Empire. Without that, Muslim and Hindu would be at each other's throats and the Nizamate would be overrun. Pickthall did not live long enough to see exactly this occur, but he must surely have known that the old Nizamate that he saw was, like Ottoman Turkey, a vestige of a passing world. After the Second World War, even though the Nizam had supported the British war effort with generous numbers of troops, 
the British gave up on the Nizamate and it was engulfed by the new state of modern India. For a brief period the Nizam declared his independence but the British would not endorse him and the last stronghold of classical Islam in the Indian subcontinent disappeared. As it happens, I visited the old city of Hyderabad in mid-2009 and spent time exploring the, the world that Pickthall knew there. The Nizam's palace complex, like the old city in general, is quite dilapidated, although one palace has been restored and so offers a contrast to the remainder. The many halls of photographs and records show a world in which the automobile was still a rarity and in which simple pre-industrial men and women went about their crafts and trades in the shadows of the vast Makkah Majid or the Chamana. Little of that era remains. The streets are clogged with cars and rickshaws and motorcycles. The air is polluted. Whole families depend upon selling cheap wristwatches made in Asia from a market stall. Only a small congregation responded to the call to prayer at the main mosque and on local television were graphic scenes of bearded Wahhabi fanatics smashing the shrine of a Sufi saint with mallets and axes. Only two signs of Muhammad Pickthall were to be seen, his photograph and one of the Nizam's displays and a ten-page pamphlet about his life and work in a dusty bookshop in the Lard Bazaar. On the far side of the city is New Hyderabad, and a high-tech cyber city for the booming i-tech industry. As for the current Nizam himself, he long ago purchased a sheep station in Western Australia and moved there. Contemporary Muslims are far more comfortable claiming a convert such as Leopold Weiss, or uh, otherwise known as Muhammad Assad, as their own. Weiss converted several decades later than Pickthall, and his road to Mecca involved him in the establishment of the Saudi regime, nationalist struggles against European colonialism, and the founding of the modern state of Pakistan, ostensibly a model of what a modern Islamic state should be. His translation of the Quran is an ambitious reinterpretation serving to accommodate science and evolution. For these reasons, vice is accessible to Muslims today but not so Marmaduke Pickthall. To reclaim Marmaduke Pickthall as a leading light among those Westerners who have followed the call to prayer and embraced the Muslim faith, it is necessary to appreciate the extent to which the world and Islam have changed and to extend our view back into another milieu. For Muslims, this means acknowledging the fact that the faith as we find it now is a modern construction that deviates from the traditional patterns traditional or classical Islam, with direct continuity with medieval Islam, was finally shattered in the early 20th century and has been replaced by a form of the religion characterised by many of the things Pickthall foresaw and feared. It is tempting to dismiss Pickthall's Islam as merely romantic, as if it were unreal. It was certainly an Islam in decline, and it is certainly not a reality today. But there is no reason why we should ignore or diminish the witness of Pickthall to an Islam that was richer and deeper than the brash, simplistic and sentimental forms that tend to prevail today.